So I finished up last week, and I knew I was going to start something new this week, so I've been preparing for this. And uh, I'm taking the thought uh, for this time is having a committed, dedicated, or surrendered life. Because I think right now, if there's ever been a time where you're going to have to have a committed, dedicated, or surrendered life, it's right now. So whatever words you want to put in there, having a committed, you might want to say dedicated, or surrendered life. Now, I believe a lot of people got born again, but they haven't dedicated uh, their total life to God. I've had people stand on this platform and ask me to dedicate their babies, but they didn't end up raising them right either. They didn't set the example before them, taking them to church. They didn't set the example before them by put, putting them in the right atmosphere for them to achieve spiritually. They did physically. They did athletically. They did other things, but not in a place where they could grow spiritually. Because when we dedicate babies, we don't baptize babies. We dedicate them. What do I say? We did this as example of Jesus. We dedicate them to the Lord, but God says, I'm going to trust you with it that you're going to raise them the way that my Bible tells to raise them, so you have a responsibility. So some people want their babies dedicated, but they refuse to raise them according to the Word of God. See, if you raise them according to the Word of God, then we know that if the world pulls on them, and if they kind of go off a little bit, that we can have faith to know that uh, I've dedicated them to God, I've raised them right with God, and I know it doesn't matter how far they tried to run, when it comes to the end, they will walk with God. That's what we have to believe. Amen. So just because someone's born again, I don't take them all as a dedicated uh, believer. There's been many people in the 15 years that's prayed at this altar to accept Jesus Christ just to find out that uh, they met him, but they chose not to walk with him. And just because somebody has a good church attendance, I might as well just pick on somebody that has a good church attendance now. Just because somebody has a good church attendance doesn't mean that they're any more dedicated than somebody that's got a one at waffles a little bit. Because dedicated to God is I'm going to walk, I'm going to live and move and have my being in him. I'm going to do what I can to walk in love, stay out of carnality, walk according to the Spirit, do everything I can to reach the destiny that God has put inside of me. I am serious about being a severe believer and not just a church attender. Thank you. And so all this is about what it is to live a dedicated life. It's like someone, I took someone to Africa years ago, years ago, this is back in the 90s, and uh, as a matter of fact, this lady, she's done in heaven now. And she got up and preached and said, I've been, I've been uh, walking with God. Or how'd she say that? Uh, uh, I've been serving God for, she named like 50 years. And they asked me, she's been preaching for 50 years? Because that's what they said, walking with God. Because to their mindset, it don't matter how, when you got saved. When are you serious about God? When are you serious about God? And I said, what she meant was she got saved 50 years ago. So I don't know how long she got serious with God. That's when they got saved. Very few people, hopefully the number's bigger than I think, got saved and never, ever turned back to the world after they got saved. People get saved, get pulled back to the world, backslide, or whatever you want to call it. It's not because they... One or two, it's just that a lot of people, when they get saved, they don't dedicate themselves to discipleship. They don't dedicate themselves to the Word of God. They don't dedicate themselves to, uh, this is how I'm going to live. When you don't stay in the Word, you don't pray, you don't hang around with God's people, you keep, you keep the same friends that keep pulling on you, it's hard for you to stay focused in it. So all that I'm talking about is all encompassed into living a dedicated life. Living a dedicated life. And uh, that's what it's all about. I don't believe people have to backslide. Now, you're saying, well, you've been baptized five times, Pastor. Yes, because of bad teaching. I mean, if you did anything wrong, folks, I'm talking about how much sin did I get into before I was 13 years old? Come on. How much sin? I realize some people live in certain areas where I've, I've talked with kids that were almost alcoholics at 13, but that wasn't my case. 
That wasn't my case. That wasn't. It wasn't alcohol. It wasn't illicit sex. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. It was, oh my God, uh, you, uh, you did something wrong and, and now you're going to hell because you sinned and you got to get born again, again, and you got to get baptized again. Oh my God, thank God I got free. That you can walk with God. Amen? Walk with God. Even the high priest in the Old Testament, they offered a sacrifice for themselves. And doing the, doing the duties of the priest, their garments got dirty again, but they didn't have to go back and get another sacrifice. They just went back to the, to, to the brazen laver and got clean. They washed in the brazen laver and got clean again. The Bible says it's, this Bible is the washing of water by the word of God. This will clean you and it will keep you clean. Amen. It will clean you and keep you clean. And so uh, I might as well, you know, loosen the corners of all things if we're going to talk about it so that we can understand. Because I'm passionate about what I'm going to do. And that is there's a time that we've got to get serious about God. Amen. Get serious about God. So let me have you turn to a text. I may not read it right away, but let's just turn to it just so I can say I did. Amen. It just sounds better that way. Go with me to John chapter 15. Yeah. John chapter 15. Angel and I were sitting with the wards and talking about this new class. And this was the one of the verse I'm going to read. When I looked at it just this last evening, I'm thinking, well, this is part of my stuff even tonight it's amazing but uh it's very crucial when you talk about committing yourself to god you can't do it without some of these verses because it's just it's just paramount to what's going on now if i won't bore you as some people told me that i tell too many stories well sir somebody said you're too young to tell this many stories but folks it's the the stories are to show you how the word of god brings you out amen uh, that's just all it is. But I remember the day after I had that encounter, I've told you about 13 in Iowa at that youth camp. It was supernatural. I was caught up in the heavens pretty much. I didn't know I was laying on the ground. I didn't know where I was at, except I was encompassed with one of the most beautiful radiant lights that I've ever witnessed. And out of that, God spoke to me. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, whatever you want to say and spoke to me about the call of God on my life, which in a way that only a 13 year old could understand. And still the phrase that he spoke to me, I still couldn't understand. And that is, I didn't call you to be a missionary. The exact words were, I call you one. Like I call you blessed. I call you one. So Try that on at 13 years old and see how it fits. There's no reference point for it. There's no reference. So after that time, the Bible says, which I didn't understand, Mark chapter 4, when the word of God comes to you, immediately the thief follows up. Am I right? Do you think that I didn't get under a 13 years old getting under attack? Well, what kind of attack could you get under at 13? Well, what kind of experience could you have at 13? It's like I told Scott and several people about the call of God. I said, no one's really going to understand it. I think people got the heart to see it done. But no one laid next to me when, I was, when the Lord came to me and, and did that. So how can you understand when you wasn't there? It's like you can't understand. We read the Apostle Paul's story, but we can't understand the zeal that he had because we didn't hear that voice. Saul, Saul, why persecutest me? We didn't hear that voice. We read about it. Why was Paul so zealous for God? <laughs> it was surrender or die that day. I mean, it was all over. Notice he didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? He said, Saul, why persecute me? God took it personal, didn't he? That's why you don't have to avenge yourself. God will, God will have your back. I said, God will have your back if you let him. That's a whole other thing. So after that, it seemed like every time I messed up, 
I felt like I had to repent and I kept repenting, repenting and repenting and, and I did something and I repented and I did something and I repented and, and me and some uh, friends were living in this area in Michigan and it wasn't a very good, you know, wasn't the best of the best locations and, and uh, we went into an area and uh, they were taking stuff out. I didn't take anything out, but because I was with them, uh, you know, you're going to hell now, you know, you're going to hell, probably going to jail too, going to hell, going to jail, everything else. And a lot of stuff like that. I'm talking about, it wasn't sin as I wasn't stealing, but then he said, Oh, Lord, I'll never do that again. You say, Oh Lord, I, I, I won't, I won't do, I won't say that again. And uh, it's like, I felt convicted over everything. And then one day, uh uh-oh, you ask God to forgive you for the last time. He'll never forgive you again. The day that came to me, it was like the coldest cold I've ever felt. I think I walked around. That's a hard thing for a boy 13 years old to live with. I walked around, I think, in the days. I walked around in the days. Oh, my God. God just said, I'm, I just know I'm called to preach. And now I blew it all. I can't preach. I, I'm going to, I can't preach because I done went too far. This was tormenting. It was tormenting. And on that little, little apartments where we lived, up the front, in the front door, up the steps, some bedrooms upstairs, two bedrooms. The one that was facing the street, I fell down on that old carpet, my face in it crying out to God. And I said, I may, this is my, I'll never forget the conversation. I can still hear it. I said, I may never ever be able to preach the gospel. Bawling. But I'm going to serve you because I love you. And I got up from there feeling like I'd never preach. Never. And I told a story that that stayed with me. That stayed with me until I attended here at 16. And I heard and explained the first time the gifts and callings of God without repentance. That one word delivered me. Now I had to go back and get all that old stuff out of me. That's why I said you got layers on you. You got layers. But that's what... Got me out of it. So from that point on, I said, I'll I'll never backslide again. And you know what? From that point on, I've never walked away from my God. Never walked away from my God. Never. 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 Has it been tough? Yes. Have has things tried to pull on you? No different than anybody else. But you make a decision. You make a decision. You keep your hands clean and your heart pure. And you live a committed life. That doesn't mean I was a perfect life. I told, I've said this about being here. I wasn't a perfect uh, young man in this church. I wasn't, when I was a youth leader and a associate with dad, I wasn't perfect. I'm learning. I, that's why I tell people all the time, we're, we're not failures, we're learners. You have to learn how to learn. Thank God he didn't cast me out. He spanked me several times, but he didn't cast me out. But you look at, I told, I told Jacob tonight, I said, if dad wasn't honest with me and helped me, uh, I wouldn't be where I was at. But when you're young, you need somebody to help you. You need somebody to help you. So it doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you have a heart. I'm not going to allow the world to take me out. Of God's plan for my life. And that's what it's about. Living a committed, dedicated, surrendered life. So uh, there's been times where I surely wasn't as hot as I could have been. But I know I wasn't as cooled off as I could have been either. You understand? I still had that conviction in my heart. Stood that conviction in my heart. But I learned 17, 18, 19, 20. Even after preaching, you learn to continue to walk with God. 
So this is not a this is not an easy thing to where I'm going to commit now and it's going to be there. No, you can't commit without the Spirit of God. You can't commit without the Word of God. And you can't commit without putting yourself in a, pos- a position to succeed. I hear coaches say all the time about athletes. College, I've been, you know, college sports is coming up. I'm excited about, I love college sports. And, uh, and they are interviewing these players. And the players, their common thing is, we're going to succeed because our coaches puts us in a position to succeed. And the point is, you got to keep yourself and be with the right people, the right leaders, to get you in the right position to succeed. You can't just live the way you want to and succeed. That's not the way the kingdom works. In these last days, people's got to understand walking with God is more than just praying a prayer. I don't want to just go to heaven and live tormented here. I don't want to go to heaven. I mean, let's say the, the rapture's not coming, and I realize that it's probably closer than we think looking at the times, and, and I understand, but people believed that for years. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But let's say I live to be a, a man of senior age. I don't want to talk about old. Of senior age. And I got born again. But I'm always defeated, always in lack, always in poverty, always getting the enemy to steal from me, always sick. What kind is that? Well, at least I'm going to go to heaven. But have a little bit of heaven to go to heaven in. That's some commitment right there. Amen. All right. You going to stay awake with me? I haven't read the verse, but I haven't stopped teaching either. Okay. Here we go. Verse 1. Chapter 15. Written in what? Red. Red. If you notice, this whole chapter is red. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Uh Uh-oh. Every, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, this whole thing is about how are we going uh, through a life of uh, walking with God, how do we become fruitful? So if we're going to be fruitful, that's where this committed and surrender life, you'll never be fruitful if you're not committed to something, you're not, if you don't surrender to it. I don't care how much in love two people are. Oh, pastor, we're gonna get married. You know, I, I've never did any premarital counseling that anybody says, yeah, we probably won't last a year. I've had them not last a year. Yeah, we probably won't last a year. We figured we'd do it, but, you know, uh, we can always get divorced if we need it. I haven't had anybody sit there and do that. I've had them say, now, you know there's challenges. Oh, honey, they don't know us, do we? <laughs> I've had those kind of meetings. I set a six-month appointment when they leave because I realized after they're married in six months. Life is life. <laughs> so we have to sometimes help. Sometimes it's very little. Sometimes it's like, dear God, I should have said that for three with this couple. Yeah, you think you have things going on like that. But, you know... You think anybody stands at the altar that says, "Do you? I commit to you and you commit to me, and they still end up on the rocks. Come on. Saying I commit is the first part of it. Following through with it is the second part of it. Amen? And I realize I'm one of many in this room. But not one time, not one time, it's never even entered. Not one time, not one time, nor has it been discussed. Not one time has Angel and I looked at each other and said, I think we made a mistake. Not one time. Not one time did we ever say, I don't know if we should have done this. Not one time did we ever say, I don't know if I can be this. Not one time. Not one time is that come. It hasn't happened. Why, you work on your marriage. 
I thought I was in love with her and I married her. <laughs> if you ask me 20 some years later about love, I didn't understand anything back then. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? It's pure, it's holy. I'm going to pray the benediction and go get her if I don't stop this stuff. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you commit, it's precious. When you commit, it's precious. Are you with me? And I think if people understand commitment, you have happier families in God, happier families with children, because they see mom and daddy are committed. They see mom and dad are committed to God, and there's something about them that affects them. Even though they can play hard, it affects them. I pray that something motivates you because it's more than saying, Lord, come to my heart. It's I'm going to walk with you, God, and I'm going to learn how to walk with you. I don't, we don't automatically know how to do it. Brittany, Madison, or Joshua naturally knew how to walk. We had to help them how to walk and then how to run and then how to sit down. <laughs> come on. That's just the way it works. That's the way it works. So here we go. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes, he purges, he trims back that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. See, the word's a cleansing agent. But when you're talking about bearing fruit, how am I going to be fruitful? I, I did a teaching on, on uh, uh, how to be fruitful in the times of sorrow, how to be fruitful in, in, in a time of affliction. And I took the life of, of Joseph and some of these people and David on, uh, on how to be fruitful in a time of sorrow, how to be fruitful in a time of affliction. How, can, how could Joseph be fruitful when he was in the prison? And there's places, you don't have to have everything right to be fruitful. To have everything right to be fruitful. We can be fruitful wherever we're planted. Some people are never going to be fruitful because they don't allow their stuff to be planted. They won't allow their stuff to be planted. But let me take a moment to set more of the table here. You've heard me talk about this, but it's, I want it down where people can go back and reference it. This word prune... And purge, cutting back, just in the last weeks, I have heard different schools of thought on this. It's not something I've heard before. I've heard it for years, but it's come up again. And that is how God will continue to put us in things to make us fruitful. The Bible says, if he wants me to bear fruit, then he'll prune me. Now, you don't prune a tree by saying, uh, I call you pruned. No. You prune a tree by getting out the, the pruners. The pruners. I was mowing under, we got a big red, a red oak. Uh, was it red oak? What do you call it? Red uh, maple. Red maple, big, that tree in the front yard is a red, big red maple tree. And uh, the branches were low. So I got out the steel. And I cut some away, man. Joanne said, I was wondering if you are going to do that. It's getting kind of low. You guys moan underneath of it. So I cut it back, and it took some of the weight off of it. You notice when you trim them heavy branches off, it kind of lifts up because some of the weight's off of it. Some of you guys get the weight off of you, and you'll... Come back up a little bit. And so I pruned. I've never seen anybody just say, I call you pruned. I just stand in front of that tree. Be pruned. No, I had to get out something that cuts. That's how it works. So they'll say, all right, God, God's going to cut you. God's going to cut away in your life and it's not going to feel good, but you know, and I was preaching. I was the youngest preacher in this minister's meeting and, and uh, I'm sitting there, youngest one now, you know, they're already saying, why is he preaching? 
And they got, you've heard the story, they got this thing. I mean, they had the sword of God bloody. And no one preacher got up and said, well, I see you, I I hear that, I'll I'll raise you one. And I mean, they all got into this, how God prunes. And this one guy said, God knows, and he got into this growly voice. God knows how to cut you without killing you. Oh, my God. Lord, I've, Lord, forgive me whatever I've done. Don't, don't, don't run that sore through me. Forgive me, you know? And I'm sitting there. I'll never forget it. I won't even add anything to it. I'm sitting there, and the Lord said, is that how I work? I said, no. They think so, but no, you don't. He said, well, tell them. I said, no. <laughs> Honestly, I did. I'm not exaggerating. He said, tell them. I said, No. No, I already did that before at a church in West Ellick. And it was, I did two meetings in one week, my first and my last. And, and uh, I wasn't going to do that anymore. No, no, I'm not telling them. He said, are you going to let them see me this way? The same word kept coming out of me. No. You going to tell them? No. And then I got so convicted in my heart. So I got up. And I said, you spent a lot of testimonies here about how God cuts away things in our life. And uh, some of you, I said, I could just see the blood dripping from the sword. And, uh, and as one person said, he'll cut you. He knows just how deep to cut you without killing you. <laughs> so... Then I took the verse that uh, you're right, he does prune, he does cut. And then I went to Timothy, 2 Timothy, which was a text here like a week or so ago. In a great house, there's not only a vessel of earth and of wood, and silver and gold, of honor and dishonor. But if a man or woman would purge himself, if a man or woman would prune himself, if a man or woman would cut back himself, that man or woman would be a vessel of honor, meet or able for the master's use. I said, here's how it works. If you're born again, the Holy Spirit's inside of you. You have the Holy Ghost in you. When you say something, you do something. And and God is wanting to make you more fruitful and get you out of that one realm of the flesh so you can go from glory to glory. He'll tell you, Ken, don't do that anymore. You, you, you don't need that in your life. And Ken will keep doing it, but he says, you don't need that in your life. You don't need that in your life. Judy, you don't need that. Bob, you don't need that in your life. And then eventually you'll say, Lord, you're right. I don't need that. I'm going get, to get rid of that. And you know what that's called? pruning because if a man therefore purge himself of these things he'll be a vessel unto honor but if you don't discipline yourself on the inside and you don't allow the spirit of God to teach you and instruct you if you can't hear within you're never going to be able to step into this dedicated committed beautiful walk with God he's not going to force you to quit he's not going to force you to quit lying he's not going to force you to quit cussing and telling dirty jokes He's not going to force you to do that. But he'll definitely prune it out of your life if you let him. He's a gentleman. He'll prune it out if you let him. That's why we say, Father, by your spirit that dwells in me, if there's things in me that's going to derail me, keep me out of your perfect will, reveal it now. Let's get this thing cut out. It's amazing if somebody says you got a cancer, the first thing they want to do is cut out. We'll pray that it disappear, but the thing is, let's get it out of there. Let's get it out of there. Why? Well, it could kill you. The wages of sin is death, folks. You got to get it out. You got to get it out. The Spirit of God can help you. He'll help you prune this and, and get this thing right. I don't know about you, but being fruitful in the kingdom is 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 an ultimate goal for all of us. How, do, how are we going to be fruitful? How are we going to be fruitful? And uh, it's amazing. Angel and I were talking. We had uh, the grandkids and just talking about how, how love creates offspring. And then you enjoy grandkids on that. It's the love. Now, sometimes it don't happen out of love. It happens out of lust. It happens out of other things. But the love of fruitfulness and the reward of fruitfulness, isn't it such a beautiful thing? 
is such a beautiful thing. And uh, if we understand that, then we want to be fruitful. We want to be fruitful. I don't want to be some grumpy, crotchety person. You want to be somebody, somebody wants to be around you. I don't want people, I told, I told um, Jacob Stephen, I said, you don't ever want to be a leader where somebody follows you because you're the pastor, you're, you're the boss, you're whatever. You want people to follow you because they see God in you. That's why you want people to follow you. It's not because you're perfect, but because they see something in you that can help them. And that's what it is to be fruitful. That's what it is to have it there. So look at three. You are already clean because of the word. The Bible said, already quoted it. We are, we are cleansed according to the scriptures by the washing of water, by the word of God. Now, here we go. Abide in me. The word abide means what? Take up your residence in me. This is where you live now. It didn't say visit with me. He says abide in me, in me, in me, in me. Not just with me. In me. Paul said, in him, I abide, I live. And in him, I move. Operating by his spirit. In him, I have my being. That's what it is, in him. If you abide, take up residence, live in me. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, how in the world can somebody... You know, live, profess Christian, and live in the world. I like that meme. I like that meme that uh, you, th- there's memes that you see on TV, I mean on Facebook, that uh, tries to get people in there about walking with God. You say one thing, but you, but you do another. There's, people are always making things like, like that. Talking about you expect God to bless you, but you're running with the world. I mean, it's amazing. Facebook's full of these memes. And I watch some people post these memes. I'm thinking, you should read your own meme. Come on now. That's right. You should read your own meme. (laughs) Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. He said, now who's the vine here? He said, Jesus said, I am the vine. My father is a husband, the vine dresser. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Didn't, didn't say just, you know, be with me, but abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Now, here's what it is. Without him, we can do nothing. I hear people saying that. Oh, I'm nothing without him. Okay, then what's the opposite of that? I'm everything in him. I'm everything in him. Monday, Sunday really, but Monday morning, uh, I kept going back over a verse that I've read I've read, I can't even tell you how many times I've read the book of Ephesians. I don't even know. There's parts of it I can just quote. I quote verbatim, act out of the King James, not the New King James, because that's where I memorized it all those years, but I can quote it verbatim. Somebody says, you, you preach out of the New King James, but every time you quote scripture, it's, it's King James. Well, that's because that's all I ingested for years. So... I just love God's word. And, uh, but even in the new members class, I talk about this verse because talk about the church. We are the church, right? We, we are the church. Uh, let me just read it to you because you don't have to go there, but it's Ephesians. Uh, it's, it's very strong. The prayer that Paul prayed in the first chapter of Ephesus, and he prayed it in the third chapter. But let me just look at the one there in uh, actually verse 22 and 23, the last two verses of chapter 1 of Ephesians. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now, who's the head of the church? Jesus. Now, who's the church? I mean, who, who, who's the head? Jesus. Who's the church? Us. 
Jesus is the head. Who is, who would be the head, which is Jesus, over all things to the church. The church. The church. So I'm going to take that because there's a comma there, right? It's not like a period and going to the next verse. It says that he's the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church, which is his body. You, which is his body. The church, which is his body. And I just kept saying that Monday. The church, which is his body. I'm out watching Josh uh, participate in a, in a school golf event, and I just was following along there, and I just kept hearing inside of me, the church, which is his body. The church, which is his body. The fullness of him. Oh, my God. I've said this, and it just kept coming up to me live again. The church, which is his body. I am the church. This is your body. This is where you dwell, in him, and me and you, and abide in me, and I abide in you. The church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Glory to God. The church, which is his body. Folks, you're the church. The body of Christ in the earth. The body of Christ in the earth. The man manifesting demons on the ground when the, when the father brought his son to his disciples, they couldn't do anything. And so Jesus comes and the boy falls down manifesting demons. Jesus, the head, the body, all in one, walking on the earth. The church didn't exist. It was Jesus. He was the head. He was the body. He was, he was the very image of the Godhead in bodily form. Amen. In him, he says, come out of him. And the boy becomes normal. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Go show yourself to the priest, to the lepers. That's what Jesus did when he was here. The church, which is his body. The things that he did. They're accessible to the body. The fullness of him. That filleth all in all. Glory to God. It makes you just want to go lay hands on something. (laughs) And not a donut. You want to go lay hands on something. Come on. You want to do that something. You want to lay hands on something. Because I'm not just Ken Harbaugh. I'm not just pastor. I'm part of the church, which is his body. I'm part of the church, which is his body. I'm part of the church, which is his body. I'm part of the church, which is his body. The disciples said, by, by, by stretching forth thy hand to heal. They understood. They were the church, which is his body. By stretching forth thy hand to heal. Does the hand come from the head or the body? The body, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the holy child Jesus. We are the church, which is. Folks, you think it's on me now. You should have been that golf cart Monday. It's just, just swarmed my spirit. I'm not just a merely Christian walking in this earth. I'm part of the church, which is his body. The fullness of him. That filleth all and all. Glory to God. Uh, it's just, this is the life that God has for us. And if we commit to it, we get the benefits of it. If we commit to it, we get the benefits of it. Amen. Without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me. Now, this is the deal. You don't have to. If you don't abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them in the fire and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words, my words, my words. You ever heard people talk and say, that don't sound like God at all. That don't sound like the Lord. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, look at this. Look how emphatic this is. I don't see anything about maybe, one day, hopefully. Look how settled this is. Do you see that? This is a settled issue. 
If we obey one through six, if you abide in me and my words abide in you now, you will ask. You may not. You will ask. You shall ask. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, folks, that ought to go ahead and put a shout in you. That ought to put a shout in you right there. I don't know if God will do it. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. What do you mean words? In the name of Jesus, you stop. In the name of Jesus, you come out. In the name of Jesus, you be settled. It's no longer head knowledge. I've now got this abiding presence of God right in here. I now got this abiding presence of God right here. Come on. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you desire and it shall. I don't know why God doesn't answer. I don't know everything either. I wish I did. I'd write the book on it and have enough money for missions for around the world. You know how many people buy that book if I knew everything? Dear God, missions would be settled. It'd be the best seller, but I don't have it. I don't know, but I do know God's word's true. God's word is true. God's word is true. Well, everything you ever asked, have, have you got it? No, it hasn't manifested in my hand immediately, but I know when that hit my spirit, even I didn't have it in my hand, I knew it settled. I told you about the money that one time. People said, when did you get it? Well, it came in the mail yesterday. But I got up and I was sitting on the floor at the foot of that bed in front of that mirror. I knew then it was done. So whatever it is, that's when you get it. So meditate on verse 7. It's good for you. You can't OD on it. You can't. It, it won't weary you. All it do is just build faith in you. God's word is medicine to us, man. It fixes us. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire or what you will, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear fruit. Now, now here's what happens is, my Father's glorified. That means it brings him pleasure. When we are walking in this, he shouts. Heaven rejoices. Because the body, the fullness of him, is in operation. The Father's glorified in it. The Father's glorified in it. The Father's glorified in it. How many wants to just glorify God? Father, be glorified in our walk with you. Be glorified in our fruitfulness. Be glorified in us being the church, the fullness of you that filleth all in all. Be glorified. Be glorified. You know, uh, matter of fact, the Bible talk, talks about it pleases God when we walk in this. And there's times I've been hurting. And I said, God, find pleasure in this. May it please you because I want this thing fixed, you know. It pleases God. It's not. I'm telling you, heaven rejoices when the body walks in victory. When Jesus' body is in victory here, heaven rejoices in this. Heaven rejoices in this. There's something about when the righteous are in authority. When the righteous are in authority, my people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule and, 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 uh, and dominate, there's no joy in that. People mourn. People mourn in that area. All right? So by this, by this my Father's glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. All right, so before we close out on this, let's, let's, let's define disciple. Let's define disciple. So this new class, it will break this down in a whole other way that we're talking about discipleship class on the master's life. By this, my father's glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. Now, disciple is not just a Christian. That don't make you a disciple. Well, I got saved. I'm a disciple. No, you're not. You're a born again believer. Hopefully you're a believer and not born again doubter. I know a lot of Christians still doubt. Hopefully you're a born again believer. Not just believe you're not going to hell anymore, but believe that God's going to rescue your life in all areas. Okay. So word disciple 
is another word that comes from it. It's a word that people love. Discipline. I mean, it almost brings pain to hear it sometimes, don't it? Discipline. <laughs> Discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. I took Sassy, our little pup, to puppy school. What a trip. Never had a dog in four like this. I had a red tick coon hound. Only thing I wanted to do is find a trail and track. Not set pretty. <laughs> and all that stuff. So, sassy. So, this whole thing was we're going to teach him a set of disciplines. So, have her set. Step back three feet. No, no, no. Stay there. Stay there. Stay there. Stay there. Sassy. Stay. There she's there. No. Stay. And so I took her every one day a week until she graduated. Yeah. The calf and gown was cute. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> until she graduated. And now, you know, Sassy would, people say, you know, why does Sassy listen to you? Well, I'm the one. When nobody's good or listening, I was the one that got her to do that. Oh, I'm telling you what. Set, and I could take a piece of dog treat, meat, and go real slow right down on her. And she'll, and I'll go right down, and I'll rub it on her nose. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Discipline. I didn't do that at first. You lose a finger. But I got to where I could do that. And I'll say, okay. Then she, okay. It's like she didn't do it until you said, okay. It's like sometime at True Disciplines Disciples, we want to do it. But when God says, okay, we're on it. When God says, okay, we're on it. But it takes a while to become disciplined like that. Like 13 weeks of puppy school. <laughs> So discipleship is discipline. Now, if an animal can be trained like that, what about people with a living spirit? How much more can God help us in disciplines? Amen? So you let the word abide in you. You abide in it. You allow God to take out whatever's not right in you. And I'll promise you, your adventure in God will be greater than you've ever imagined in your life. Amen. Why? I can't get it out of me because you are the church. His body. The fullness of him that fills all in all. Amen. All right, let's stand together. Glory to God. I about preached myself happy tonight.